So in this chapter, we're going to talk about controlling microbes. We talked about what microbes need in order to grow and reproduce, and now we want to make sure that they don't get too out of control, especially in certain situations. And so we talked in other chapters about how something like an E. coli bacteria could potentially, if it has the right conditions, copy itself every 20 minutes. So if you started off with 100 E. coli, 20 minutes later you could have 200. 20 minutes later you could have 400. After just a few hours, this would actually multiply very quickly and could get into the trillions as far as bacteria numbers go. And so we need to at least be able to control growth or even sometimes eliminate growth. And certainly, especially in public settings like uh, public bathrooms, hospitals, restaurants, factories where our food is being processed, um, and then also our homes, these things need to be under control. Do they need to be completely under control all of the time? Do we need to kill off absolutely everything that's there? No, but again, especially in a hospital setting, it's probably a little more crucial if somebody has a surgery or something like that. So we're going to be talking about um, physical methods of control and chemical methods of control. And then we're going to also be talking about medicines that are able to treat um, infections once they are causing diseases. And so we'll be talking a little bit about some of these scientists in here. We've talked about them before as well. But kind of the need for sanitation came about in the late 1800s. Um, we've mentioned before Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch um, coming up with the germ theory, basically um, coming up that the theory that microorganisms organisms did indeed cause disease. Um, another one we'll talk about more later in this chapter is Joseph Lister and disinfection. And then also Alexander Fleming and the invention of penicillin, which you probably know as a current antibiotic. And so if we look at physical methods, first of all, um, there's some terms that come about. And sometimes it's important to have um, sterilization. Other times sanitization is OK, too. And so it's important to realize what sort of the goal is when we're looking at the different scenarios. Sterilization is complete destruction, removal of all forms of life. And this includes endospores of bacteria. Um, we've mentioned endospores before as far as being the hardy structure of bacteria kind of goes into a hibernation state and allows bacteria to become viable when um, conditions improve. And so these can be very dangerous as well, certainly some of the diseases that they're capable of causing. Um, other terms that we'll look at here, disinfection and antisepsis. This is removal and killing of most forms of life. This probably is not going to work on endospores and other things that are pretty resistant. Um, the difference between these two here is just whether you're dealing with a non-living surface or a living surface. So if you're using alcohol um, to clean your cell phone, I guess you would be using it as a disinfectant. But if you're using it to clean a wound on your hand or to get ready for a shot or something like that, then it would be an antiseptic. Uh, sanitization is really just lowering the microbial count to a safe level, not expecting to get rid of everything. Um, a lot of times this can occur in um, different places where maybe a bar or a restaurant where they're just washing drinking glasses and the standards are a little bit lower there. Everything does not need to be completely sterilized, although you might like it to be. Uh, de-germing is really just the physical removal, not killing microbes, but if you think of kind of washing your hands, um, or if you just washed your hands with water and used some pressure to kind of rub your hands, some of those microbes would be, you know, going into the drain of the sink. So that would be considered to be de-germing. One type of physical method that we'll look at here is heat, and there's a lot of different ways to use heat. But what heat does usually is denatures. That means it breaks down the structures of the cells and then takes away the water. And so when we look at what a cell needs, they have certain requirements. And if you take those away, they can't survive. And so the first one is moist heat. So that's using heat in the presence of water. Um, you probably have boiled water before, maybe for the purpose of uh, killing things off. Uh, sometimes we're under a boil order from the city because there's been some kind of um, recognition that the water is not quite as clean as it should be or some kind of issue. And so boiling water is certainly an effective method at killing off um, everything that's in it, as long as it's done for the right amount of time. We also have an autoclave, um, which I'll show you here in just a second. But that is a machine that actually puts a lot of pressure along with heat and water and kills in order to sterilize as well. 
Pasteurization wouldn't necessarily sterilize things. Um, there's different methods here, but it's basically your heat shocking something just for a few seconds. And so it could be longer, it could be higher temperatures, there's different types, but it basically is killing off most things so that your food doesn't spoil as quickly. And so if you think about a container of milk, it can last for a pretty long time. If it's pasteurized in your refrigerator, does it eventually go bad? Yes. But if it were not pasteurized, it would go bad much more quickly and potentially be a little more dangerous depending upon what was growing in there. Um, as far as dry heat goes, an oven can be used. Um, a direct flame in microbiology where there's a lab class, we are constantly um, using a metal loop and in order to sterilize it once we have bacteria on it, we just put it into a flame and it gets kind of red hot and that oxidizes things and kills things. For larger items, we could put them in an incinerator and so that would just be a large vessel that um, basically burns things up. So pretty high temperatures. This is kind of a good figure to look at, especially for uh, maybe kind of a conversion between Fahrenheit and Celsius. And so it also kind of tells you about different temperatures here and what happens to bacteria. And so if you look here, um, something like uh, 5 degrees Celsius, that would be a refrigerator temperature. Um, 37 degrees Celsius is human body temperature. I know oftentimes we're not exactly well versed in the Celsius scale, but if you can remember something like 37 degrees Celsius is about the same as 98 degrees Fahrenheit, that's pretty important to realize. And then higher temperatures up here, it tells you kind of what is killed off um, as far as endospores versus um, just bacteria without their spores or not as well. This is kind of what an autoclave may look like. This is a fairly small autoclave, about similar to the size that we have here at Highland. Um, and so basically you're gonna put these vessels usually in glass, you're gonna put them inside the autoclave and close the door, we turn it on, pressure builds up, um, steam circulates around, and basically everything in this container here would get pressure and heat subjected to it, and that would kill things off. You need to make sure that you leave it in there for the right amount of time in order to um, act effectively, but that is capable of achieving sterilization. Radiation is another physical method that can be used, and so a lot of times certain wavelengths of light um, are going to destroy DNA or maybe sometimes just damage DNA. And what it basically does is where there are two T's in the DNA, the two nitrogen bases, um, thymine, there's A, C, T, and G. And so the two T's kind of kink together and it disrupts the DNA and doesn't make it very effective. And so if you're disrupting DNA in a bacterial cell and it can't go on to multiply, that's a method of control. And so there's different types of radiation. Ultraviolet light is usually very effective. Um, if you look on this chart here and you can kind of see where uh, the wavelengths are, we have kind of a range for bacteria, a wavelength of 170 to 270, um, as far as what might actually kill them and damage their DNA. And so certainly other things are going to react as well. And so you can look at that, um, but the shorter wavelengths of light are going to be more damaging. There's also drying, which is called desiccation. There's different ways to do that, but basically if, if a cell does not have water, then it's not going to grow. Um, in the case of bacteria, you can desiccate cells and they can then be rehydrated later and they can be fine, they can be viable. Um, with endospores, they can actually dry out more on their own and come back in right conditions and really can also remain viable, can go back to that original cell that it was before. Um, lyophilization is just a special term for freeze drying. A lot of times when we receive bacteria for working in our lab, um, we receive the cultures that are lyophilized. Osmosis is another good way um, to preserve foods and things like that because if you have a can, let's say you have a can of salty green beans, uh, the salty solution would be a hypertonic environment. If you had bacteria or other microbes in there like maybe uh, mold or whatnot, then there's going to be pressure for the water to actually move to the higher concentrated environment or the hypertonic environment. So if water leaves those cells, then those cells are going to die off and your food should be safe from getting infected. Uh, filtration just traps different particles. And so if you were to filter a liquid um, through 
here you can kind of see if you have a bacterial cell um, the liquid is small enough to fit through these holes or these pores but the bacterial cell is not and so this pore here would have to be you know probably about a half of a micrometer and so the liquid goes through but the bacteria gets trapped here as well and so you would have your sterilized liquid on the bottom with your bacteria getting trapped in the filter you would need some kind of a vacuum to create a suction here as well this can be done with liquid this can be done with air and maybe you've heard of a HEPA filter as far as maybe you have that on your vacuum cleaner um, I have a HEPA filter on my vacuum cleaner except I haven't changed it in years so I imagine it's probably not very effective other methods here, low temperatures usually slow bacterial growth. It doesn't necessarily kill them, but if you have food and you have certain bacteria that you know, prefer room temperature to grow and you put them in the refrigerator, then you're likely not going to get any multiplication of those. And you know, we can handle a few bacteria. It's when they multiply to higher amounts that they could potentially make us sick. And so lower temperature just simply slows down the growth, but usually does not kill them. So then looking at chemical methods yet, this is a good time to introduce Joseph Lister. Um, he's one of my favorite scientists, and he was a Scottish surgeon, and he just started to notice that when he was performing surgeries, a lot of times surgeries would be as um, important as amputations if somebody has an infection. Um, you know, back in the 1800s, they did not have a good way to sort of deal with that. And so a lot of times, um, you know, surgery just involved cutting limbs off and so people would have these large open wounds and a lot of times they wouldn't necessarily die from what they initially had but they would die from infection and so he started coming up with this method of using uh, carbolic acid and just spraying it on the wounds using it during surgery um, sterilize or cleaning the surgical instruments that he had and a lot less people died people still died but not definitely not as many and so people started really using his methods after that as well. And so when we have chemicals, again, they're more likely to achieve antisepsis or disinfection, which usually is enough. Um, oftentimes we need heat to cause sterilization. But we also have a lot of different chemicals, and they're going to work differently on different types of species. And so when we look at this chart here, it kind of gives you an idea of what are some characteristics of a good chemical agent to use. And so you do want them to kill microbes. If it dissolves in water, it's going to be a lot easier to use. Um, you want it to actually last if it's sitting out, um, be able to be stable kind of so it has a good shelf life, so it actually works on the organisms themselves. Um, we'd like it not to be toxic to humans or animals. Um, we don't want it to react with other organic matter that might be around. And we want to have it a good action, usually at room or body temperature, a strong action there because that's probably what we'll be dealing with as well. Um, if we're dealing with some sort of surface that's not kind of a flat surface, we want it to be able to get in there. You know, maybe you're cleaning up carpet or you're cleaning some kind of fabric or something like that. Um, or you're cleaning skin. We want that to be able to get in there properly. And so we want it to be reasonable. Um, we want to use kind of the smallest strength that we possibly can and still be effective. If you kind of think about using some things in your house, if you're using um, bleach, when we use bleach in the lab to... Uh, disinfect, we use a 10% bleach solution. Would a 100% bleach solution work? Sure. But would it be kind of too much? Would it, it's really not necessary to sort of use all that. And it can be damaging um, to our skin and things like that. And we certainly don't want to inhale that if we don't need to. So some of the chemical methods are listed here. I'm not expecting you to really remember specifically what each one does. Um, but you can just see there's a lot of different types out there. And so when we look at alcohols, um, you probably have used alcohol before as a disinfectant or antiseptic. And so we kind of look at what it actually does to the cell. And so in this case, uh, breaking down proteins so that they can't work and dissolving lipids can certainly damage a cell. If we think about a bacterial cell, especially a gram-negative bacteria that has that outer lipid layer, um, breaking down that cell could be done by alcohol. Peroxides also work quite well. Um, they have this form of oxygen. It's the super radical, and that can be toxic to microbes. So microbes have ways of dealing with this, and they can actually break down peroxide, um, but others don't. This is one, when we test this in the microbiology lab, this one usually, hydrogen peroxide, usually works pretty well on most of the species that we tested on. 
halogens like iodine, uh, maybe if you've had any surgical treatment or even just used a first aid kit, sometimes you might have iodine in there to clean a wound. Uh, chlorine, like in bleach, and that's where I mentioned that 10% bleach solution. You could use 100%, but 10% is probably just as effective and certainly a lot less dangerous and cheaper, and so it's important to realize that. Other heavy metals that are listed here can be used. We just have to be careful um, when we're using these because sometimes they can be toxic. Soaps and detergents often, if you just kind of think about, you know, sometimes soap that you use to wash your hands may not really kill anything. Um, it could maybe break down a cell membrane, but also it kind of has that de-germing effect as well. But there's other things that contain like aluminum chloride, um, and it's called a quat. And so if, if you have kind of a foamy appearance, if you've ever used mouthwash, you know it gets kind of foamy, um, that may have a quat in it as well. Uh, phenols, you probably have heard of Lysol. Um, use that in some amounts, lots of different products out there for that. And then triclosan is kind of a newer uh, phenol that's been used, and it's oftentimes used in soaps, so antibacterial soaps. Uh, the problem with some of these is, is that, you know, we don't want to do overkill. If we use too much of these things and we kill off some of the weaker species but not the more resistant, then we may have more trouble on our hands as well. So we definitely don't want to overdo it. We want to kind of do what's necessary to remain healthy, but it's also okay to be exposed to some things as well to kind of increase our immunity. A few other chemical methods that are listed here, um, aldehydes, um, if you've ever been in a science lab that involves dissection, maybe it's been, you've been exposed to formaldehyde or formalin, it's pretty nasty stuff, but it can be used to uh, kill, but also then preserve specimens as well. Uh, ethylene oxide is actually a gas, and that can be used too as well, but we have to be very careful because that can be kind of reactive and highly volatile as well. So it certainly has to be used under certain circumstances.